and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a man of many arts, and now venturing into the wonderful world of TTRPG design with the upcoming project Abaddon the Thirteen Seals, mixing two mixing two loves of mine, cards and and um dark fantasy, the one and only Lost Heaven. How you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me here. Um, thanks for uh, this thanks. is. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming on. Thanks and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way here. <laughs> yeah, this is um, it's not the first uh, podcasty type interview I've done. It's the first one I've done in a while, though. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm I'm a bit rusty to being on the mic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, whereas whereas I'm do I'm doing this so much that I have to be bullied into taking vacations. <laughs> there. Yeah, so there. Sad thing is, I'm only half joking <laughs> with that. Um, but well, yeah, it was on vacation that I actually initially got the idea for making a card-based system. So, so I li I usually go into I usually open up with the humble beginnings as tradition around here. Uh, so with that in mind, walk me through your fir first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay. Um, my first introduction to role playing games. Um, I was I was about ten uh, at the time. I was uh, up at an aunt's. Um, I had an older cousin. He was into video games and tabletop games and stuff. Uh, and I happened to go into his bedroom when he had some friends over. They were all playing second edition D and D. Uh, and they, they needed a fourth player, <laughs> and so I got roped into playing a cleric, um, because no one else wanted to play one, but they wanted someone who could use healing spells. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I've always kind of liked fantasy and stuff. Like I remember watching the Arnold Schwarzenegger Conan movie and stuff like that when I was probably too young to be watching it with my dad. Uh, and so I just kind of took to D and D and, and fantasy in general, and then yeah, I got into other fantasy games or like video games, uh, Baldur's Gate games and stuff like that on the PC. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just it's just always stuck. Yeah. Um, the funny thing of the funny thing about Conan is that film almost got X rated. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah. Now, granted, but, with, um, Co with Conan the Destroyer, I wish it was X-rated. <laughs> yep. <laughs> even th even though an idea an idea that they had at the time was to tr was to try and do, try and um do something similar to what's to what's done with James Bond, of having different mm. actors playing playing Conan throughout the years. Which I wouldn't have I wouldn't have minded because there's yeah, a, there's a worked. there's a galaxy of difference between how Conan is portrayed in the Arnold movies, which is more which is more about working around Arnold's weaknesses. Yep. Than um than how he's portrayed in in say the in say either the either the old Marvel or the Dark Horse comics. I haven't seen the more recent Marvel run, or the or the way he's portrayed in the books yeah and the the robert e howard stories mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a, a quite a big difference between all three media yeah and at the very at the very least in do in doing that kind of anthology like approach you might be able to get a little consistency because even though there's differences here and there you look at all you look at all the bonds over the years and there's the and you can use you it's pretty consistent throughout yeah there's certain things that you come to expect in a bond movie yeah 
I know I know it'd be tempting to bring up Doctor Who with this, but that actually is on the opposite end where each of the doctors is going to is going to be there are going to be certain certain traits that all doctors have, but some of them are going to be more emphasized than others. Yeah. So it doesn't really count doesn't really count for that. Um but would it be would but um would it be fair of me to to say that you jumped around through a bunch of different systems over the years as far as what as far as what you'd run or play yeah that would be very very fair of you to say I, i've played a, a ton of different systems over the years mm-hmm. um uh yeah um i don't even think i could count the, the number of different systems i've played over the years um well, before we went live, I know you mentioned World of Darkness being being one. Yep. Um, yep. Um... In lieu in lieu of in lieu of make not making so we don't have to go through the full, the full list, which might which might be um, asking a bit much. I'd like to take the opposite approach and play a bit of word asso- and play a bit of word association, kind of the RPG version of a Rorschach test. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that's cool. So. Yeah. I'll I will name an RPG and you can tell me if you've played it, you've heard heard of it, or if or if there's something specific with with that name. Um, Warhammer Fantasy. Yep, I played first and second edition mm-hmm. Warhammer Fantasy. Um, Dark Heresy. <laughs> yeah, I've played Dark Heresy and uh, a lot of the. Associated games like Death Watch and things like that. I actually recently picked up uh, Imperium Maledictum, which is the new Cubicle Seven mm-hmm. Warhammer 40k game that uses the same D100 system that Dark Heresy and things like that use as well. Yeah. Um, I actually got a chance to interview Graham Graham Davis, the guy who made Warhammer Warhammer Fantasy First Edition, um, not too yeah. long, um, some time back. Uh, it is kind of funny that he had, he had mentioned that in the early days they they tried to use the same die system as Warhammer Fantasy Battle until they realized they were painting themselves into a corner. Yeah, yeah. I think the D one hundred system works. Mm-hmm. Um, Rune Quest. I have not played Rune Quest, but I've heard of it, and it is on my list of games to to try out. Um. Well, let me let me let me go with something a little a little easier in the in the same ballpark. Call of Cthulhu. Oh yeah, I've played Call of Cthulhu. Mm-hmm. Uh, Traveler. I have played Traveler. I played a one shot of Traveler at a convention. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. Mm-hmm. Probably died in character creation. Uh, no, but I did end up with a character that had a lot of problems right from the get go. Um, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Not played, but I've heard of it. Uh, Alright, um, Hero System. Uh, I've played the Hero System, I think it, there's a superhero game that uses the Hero System champion? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, there's there's kind of, there's a weird chicken and egg situation where champions technically came first and then then it morphed yeah, then, the heroes, yeah. got, then hero system took over and champions just became a setting for heroes for yeah. hero system. So I've played I've played champions, which yeah. Um Mutants and Masterminds. I have played Mutants and Masterminds. I'm gonna be oh, I hate superhero games. <laughs> but I've played quite a few of them. Well, mutants and well, superhero games are 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 not are downstream from universalist games. Yeah. Uh, sometimes sometimes by design. Yeah. Um. Mork Borg. I, I've not played Mork Borg. I've heard a lot of good things about it. It is also on the list of games to try out. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I've heard, it definitely sounds like it would be. Something that'd be up my street, though. Um, Conan, whether whether it be Mo- whether it be Modifus or, um, or Mongoose. 
Uh, I've never played the Mongoose version. I have played one of the starter, like, pre-written adventures for the Modiphius game to, to try out the system. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, come on. There... Okay, yeah, there's one. There's one that's. There's one that's in the. Um, since you since you mentioned, um, wor since you mentioned World of Darkness, um, I'll get I'll get the ridiculous one out of the way and um, Mage. Uh, Awakening or Ascension. Either. <laughs> uh, I have played Mage the Awakening. Uh, I've ran Mage the Awakening. Uh. Compared to even looking at the book for Mage the Ascension, uh, Awakening is a, an easier game to pick up and play. It is. Ascension ha uh, Ascension has. I won't say it's been my whipping boy, but we but we have made the joke that Mage the Ascension is the game where you make reality your bitch. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I'm, I'm the small minority of World of the Darkness fans that preferred New World of the Darkness to to Classic, uh, and. For me, it depends. On, it it depends on which it depends on which which I'm looking at. Um, I will I will state that I va I vastly prefer the New World of Darkness run of Werewolf to the old. Because, oh yeah. Um, Where Werewolf the Forsaken is a much much more enjoyable game than Apocalypse. Uh. The problem I always had with Apocalypse is it suffers from what I from what I call the Moriarty problem. Mm -hmm. Where every every single threat in some form or fashion has to tie back to the worm. Yeah, that is a that's a bad idea for setting up your universe because you're bottle you're bottlenecking what you can do with it. Like, yeah, um, I I feel that way about a few things from classic World of the Darkness. Um... But yeah, I think Werewolf definitely suffers from it the the most. Yep. Um, Star Wars D six. Uh, like the West End Games version. Um, yeah. I have not played it. Um, I I've heard a lot about it, but I've never ever played it. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the same in the same vein with Star Wars, um, Saga Edition. Uh. I have played Saga Edition. Saga Edition is what I would consider the best version of the D twenty system. I I can I can certainly see that. Um, it did get it did get a little bit annoying that um, use the, that somebody who knows what they were doing could make use the force and Omni skill. Mm. But I look at that as a unintended consequence kind of thing. Yeah. Although tr truth be told, if I if I were to redo Saga Edition, I would have had use the Force be split, not ki not kill it off as a skill, but just di just divide its just divide its uses. Yeah, 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 you can split into a few things like Force reflexes and things like that. Well, there's um, already there's already something pre built with um, D6 because it had three types of Force use: control, sense, and alter. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Um, Saga has the talent trees for those sort of things but they yeah they do, they do different things yeah, you, you can do um, both um um 13th age I have heard of but I've never played 13th age mm -hmm. um feng shui <laughs> I have played Feng Shui. Uh, we did a one shot of Feng Shui Second Edition where we were playing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm. uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, well, it'd be it'd be it'd be easier to run that than run the actual T TMNT yeah. role playing game. And <laughs> speaking of that, Rifts. Uh, I have never played Rifts. <laughs> I've heard a lot about Rifts. I don't think I want to play them. I love risk setting. I just don't. I just don't like running the Palladium system because I get triggered by bad navigation in books. <laughs> mm. Yep. And Palladium books are notorious for their index problems. Yeah. Um, I think a few games suffer from that. 
problem, but yeah, I've heard Palladium are really, really bad for it. Yeah, they they've they've been in, they've been infamous for as long for as long as I've been gaming for that for that issue, and it's the reason why I've picked on them a bunch of times. Um, <laughs> any Savage Worlds entry? Uh, Deadlands. I, fi- I figured it. I figured it was going to be Deadlands. <laughs> yeah, but I am a big fan of Deadlands. Um, oddly enough, for me, my entry point wasn't Deadlands; it was Solomon Kane. Oh, yeah, that's that's a pretty cool entry point. Uh, and this was this was right around the time that the movie was coming out was coming out, which for whatever reason took months to come to the states, even though it was available in the U- in the UK for a while. That's odd. Usually it's the other way around. Um Yeah, it took it took like 8 months before before I could, before you could get it uh, um legit e- even even when it came even when it comes to um on on demand services. Um for the longest time it was UK exclusive. That's that's really weird. Apparently apparently the reason for it was that it was there was difficulty finding a US distributor. Okay. Yeah. Um. That. Uh, I suppose that would cause a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. Um. I wonder why. Why it was difficult to find a distributor for it in America. I'm not. I'm not entirely. Sh- I'm not entirely sure. Um. It might be. Um. I think. I think some people may have hyper focused on the whole Solomon Kane being a Puritan, and got the and uh, got the wrong idea. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Except even I have read I have read through all of his stories, and Solomon Cain is not a is not a Bible thumper like some like some no. people would think. <laughs> if, um, if anything, yeah, no. he, if anything, he he barely he barely brings up his faith. Yeah, no, he doesn't doesn't bring up his faith very often in the, the stories. Yeah, mostly mostly because mostly because. Um, he is far too su- he is far too sullen to e- to e- to even think about being a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> he would be the absolute worst. Um, but since since you since you mentioned um sa- since you mentioned Savage Worlds, I may as well go with another um Universalist affair. Um, any entry within the Cipher system, like Numenera or the Strange. I have not played any Cypher system games. I've got a friend who really, really likes the system, but I've I've never actually had the chance to play or run any Cypher yeah. system stuff. So. Um, and the la- last one I'll go with um, Shadowrun. <laughs> um, I I tried to run a Shadowrun game. Um. We did character creation, and that burnt out all of my players. <laughs> so we never even even ran the game. Yeah, this is the reason why I'm I'm I've always been kind of iffy about the about the whole about character creation that does that goes with the whole. Okay, you have this many points to spend to spend on everything. Now go do it. Um, I call I this. I think there's a, a balance with it, um, and. Shadowrun does not have that. <laughs> um, it's start. It's start with um with fifth edi- with fifth and sixth edition. The approach that they started to take was the priority system, mm. which yeah. makes things easier. There is still the problem that there's too many damn skills. Yeah, it was like, third or fourth edition. We tried to. Play. Yeah, third edition is contentious. And fourth fourth edition a little bit less so, but it still has that problem. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, it's a case of do do we really do we really need a skill for every single type of firearm? Yeah, no, nah, it seems a bit a bit much. Oh. But now with now um with at with Abaddon, I know that you. On the document you sent me, I, I know that you mentioned that it draws inspiration from Diablo and Darkest Dungeon. But one thing, but one thing I'm curious about is, 
when you do you do you find yourself leaning more towards dark fantasy than traditional high fantasy or is are 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 you not that are you not that picky when it comes to um fantasy that you that you would run before developing Abaddon? No, yeah, I tend to run uh, like lean towards dark fantasy opposed to high fantasy. Um like when I used to run third edition D and D like years back, you know, um, my campaign for that was dark fantasy, and I stripped out a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my favorite game systems are things like the One Ring, although like Tolkien's fantasy is high fantasy. The sort of heroes that you play in the One Ring aren't. Uh, it's a more grounded. Mm-hmm. It's... Fantasy, um, and like uh, Green Ronin's Chronicle Systems, which used to be the Song of Ice and Fire role playing game, um, mm-hmm. is a favorite of mine as well. And it's it's far more gritty and grounded fantasy. Um, you pro- you probably get a, k- even though it has some high, even though it has some high fantastical elements, you'd probably get a kick out of L five R. I love L five R, but again, I tend to strip out a lot of the fantasy elements. Um, I was running a campaign on an actual play over in uh, DMDM Studios for months. Uh, and it was the first time any of them would play the L5R. And it was very much a politically focused campaign with like the, the Empire was in Civil War and they all loved it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I like L5R. Mm. It's, it's a favourite. Uh, if I were to... If I... If someone had to put a, if someone had to put the proverbial gun to your head and na- and ask you to name your favorite clan, which name is coming out? Mantis. Oh, the oh the new kids. I like the Mantis clan. Well, um. Uh-oh. If I, if I had to go with one of the the original great clans, though, it would uh, probably be the unicorn. Ah, uh, ah, uh, the the otakus. <laughs> yep, yep. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A giant woman riding a horse. Yeah, I had, I had, I had to make that joke. Um, not that I'm, not that I'm one to talk because my, because my choice is, um, scorpions. Fair. Yep. Um. Just remember, I, ninja... I'll be, I'll be. I, I like all of the clans in L five R for different reasons, but yeah, I like I like the ones that are actually l- less samurai, a little bit more like the like the Magnus and Unicorn clans. Um, well, an, an annoying thing I've had to deal with as as an L five R fan for years is the is people bringing up the real samurai thing, which mm. is about as dumb as as saying real spies aren't like James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> Um, like it'd be like playing D and D or something, saying like playing a paladin and saying they're real knights, talking about real knights, and it's like, but they're not. They're in a fantasy world, and they can do. There's a, there's a phrase a friend the of mine. <laughs> there's a phrase a friend of mine has has used that um that I I often used to sh- I often used to shut down the the whole realism cl- um arguments that I, that I see. You play elf games. Yep. <laughs> like, I lo- I love game design discussions as much as much as the next guy, but some but but some designers and and some people in those discussions tend to have a head up their own ass problem. Yeah, where they they tend to get hung up in really dumb dumb missions yep. with with game design. Uh, like it. I'm okay with leaning a bit simulationist, but once, but when you start trying to figure in, when you start trying to figure in the, um, the way medieval mar- the way medieval markets would work in a game where you're not where you're not trying to play as a merchant, you're going a step too far. Yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, one of the one of the things that really grabbed my attention with Abaddon was the fact that you were using a card based um, setup. So. I should I should ask was were you putting aside Savage Worlds because that doesn't count? 
<laughs> were you already familiar with other RPGs that were using card-based systems? Mm, not really. Not group-based, but like not a traditional role-playing game. I know a lot of solo games use... Not even playing cards. They tend to use tarot cards for a lot of solo role-playing games. Um... I know there's a few out there that use playing cards, but I've never actually played one other than Savage Worlds, which only really uses it for initiative and a few other. Yeah, which is why I don't count Savage Worlds. I need to hear now. Um, but the... like, yeah, no, um, I just, like, I was in vacation. I was kind of bored. We had a deck of cards for playing in the the hotel room or playing around the pool or whatever mm. um and the cog wheel started going and i was like uh, there's there's just as much if not more variation in a card deck than in a dice so like theoretically you could make something pretty in depth with a deck of cards and most people have a deck of cards somewhere so it, mm. it's not like it would be a barrier to entry um, because not everybody has a tarot card deck, which a lot of people tend to play with if they're working on card-based systems, but, like, almost everybody has a playing card deck or can get a hold of a playing card deck. Yeah, you can, you can get, you can get it, you can get a, you can get a playing card ge deck in a gas station, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, you, you could go to, like, a pound shop or dollar store or something like that and probably pick up a pack, mm -hmm. um... Now, if you if you want it, if you want the nicer look if you want the nicer packs obviously that's gonna that's gonna cost you yeah. more, more than a uh, tenner but and I think that was an appealing thing as well like people collect dice people like to have pretty dice but like you can get some really nice playing card decks as well so if you wanted something a little bit fancier to play with uh, I do ha I do have a mod I do have a modded d20 where instead instead of the number one it just it just has fuck written on it. <laughs> oh. I like that. <laughs> but the the original idea was I want I wanted to, which I could I couldn't do was I wanted a D twenty that had um that had an expletive for ev for every side. <laughs> oh, problem problem was I ran out I ran out of ways to make it work, <laughs> but the. The interest I have, I have long since gone to bat for you for using card for using card based mechanics because I really I really feel that there's a ridiculous amount of untapped potential there because when I th when I think of when I think of card when I think of card based RPGs the the list is rather low I mean yeah the Patient Zero were the two games that TSR put as part of the Saga system though that being um, Dragonlance Fifth Age and Marvel Super Heroes Adventure Game, not to be confused with Marvel Phase Rip. Um, there's the five different games that um, that ta that Tab Creations puts out for the Saga Machine, um, stuff like Against the Dark Yogi, Dime Adventures, Shadows Over Soul, um, which all use his Saga Machine system. Um, I'm currently covering Faith, which you, which also uses cards. It has both its own de its own deck, but it can easily adapt a standard playing card deck. But it's slim pickings. Yeah, I think Faith was one that uh, when I was talking about making a card based game, someone recommended, and I think I did a quick sort of look over it, and it, yeah, um, it wasn't quite what I was um, looking for with a. Card based system. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I prob I probably would have. I probably would have recommended looking at looking at Saga Machine instead instead of Faith. Faith is a bit more specific, and since you're doing you're doing dark you're doing dark fantasy, uh, a space opera is not is not quite yeah, going, not, to, going to fit, fit the bill. Um, I mean the. I mean, may maybe I would have maybe I would have recommended looking at Shadows Over Soul, which is more more of a horror leaning um more of a horror leaning SF. Uh, 
I'd I'd say I'd say it's taking notes from Alien, but that is kind. But that's kind of redundant. Yeah, that's like the the go to for horror sci fi. Mm -hmm. um, um, I did I did run it once you for a for a one shot that was heavily inspired by, um, a, by a '90s film called Virus. Okay. Because. Because the practical effects with with virus when I saw that when I saw that as a kid messed with my head and um, <laughs> everybody everybody at the table knew about the thing and that's what they were expecting me to go with, which to be fair thing is also can also be nightmare inducing for a young for a young child but it was a bit obvious. <laughs> yeah. But. Um. The other one is Event Horizon tends to be a pretty good Horizons go to for sci yeah. high sci fi horror. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Even that, that mm -hmm. has some alien elements as well. Yeah. But... Now, one of the one of the things one of the things that I f I found kind of interesting was with the archetypes that you have. Um, yeah. Is the is is what is of the is there isn't was it by design that there isn't really a a fighter equip a fighter equivalent? Um. Yeah. Um. So th there's only four archetypes in Abaddon. Mm -hmm. Uh, the PDF that I sent you, I think, only has three skill trees for each of them, but yeah. they all they all actually have four four skill trees. Uh, four is a reoccurring thing because it, it kind of works with like there's four sets in a card deck, and mm -hmm. I was trying to kind of keep it on on theme like that. Um, the closest thing to a fighter uh, is the faithful archetype. Um, they have a skill tree that isn't in that PDF called the Paragon Tree, which has abilities that allow them to dish out more damage with weapons or pierce armor or do more damage when they counter attack and things like that. It makes them more of a a frontline fighter. Um, mm -hmm. And so the archetypes that are there are quite broad. They all have a particular theme to them, but they're broad enough that if you combine the skill, the different skill trees in different ways, you can kind of customize your character to fit certain roles and do do different things. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's no straight up fighter. Um... And when it comes to when it, when it came to the um tre the trees that you have, I I do like how you tr how you tried to get how you tried to get a little bit creative with um with the presentation of them. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, did anyone bring up Shiver to you? Uh, no. Because that was something that immediately came to mind when I when I saw the, uh, when I saw the way the trees are set up. Shivers, tree, Shivers advancement trees are a little bit more structured, but there, but there was some, there was some, oh, there was some overlap. Um, and I think I think the other the other thing I do find interesting, and this is the reason why I name dropped Shadow of the Demon Lord earlier, is the rule of thirteen that you have. Yeah. Where every where um no matter no matter what, when you're when you're doing an action, you're trying to you're trying to get at least you're trying to get at least a sum of thirteen. Yeah. Uh, so like thirteen, uh, thirteen is a number that has a lot of negative connotation. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, it felt fitting. Mm -hmm. Um. It. So in the the version that you've got it. It mentions that it, you're only really looking for a 13. Uh, after test playing, uh, there's wiggle room there, depending on how skilled your character is and your, the ranks and things that you have in various skills can adjust that range, but 13 is always going to be the bare minimum that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's because it's generally seen as an unlucky number, uh, is why I picked it. Um, 
there's a little bit of flavour text at the start of the PDF that talks about how there are 13 demon lords. Uh, and so, similar to, like, the number four reappearing throughout the game, that number 13 reappears both in the mechanics and the the flavour and setting uh, of the game as well. Mm-hmm. And now when it comes... When it comes to the when it comes to the four when it comes to the four archetypes we you have we have the the elementalist the faithful the hexing and the stalker. Um, yeah. Now, what I know you I know you mentioned that. Do you have it planned where each um each archetype is going to have is going to have four skill going to have four skill trees total? Yeah, they're going to have four skill trees total. Yeah. So, would the fourth tree for the elementalist be earth, or do you have, or do you have yeah. something different in mind? Uh, the fourth skill tree for the elementalist is pyromancy, which is earth magic, and it's more of a support tree. Like the other three are very much offensive magic. Uh, the cold tree kind of allows for a lot of crowd control type effects where you can slow monsters down and uh, weaken them and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the earth, the earth tree is very much uh, there's there's healing magic and protective magic and there's there's a few offensive spells but it's it leans more towards being a support tree than the other three in the elementalist yeah. archetype tend to. But it It'd be fair to say that the Elementalist is ideal for those who want to be the Blaster Caster. Yeah, uh, they are a glass cannon. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the archetypes have different hit points and magic point mm-hmm. multipliers. Uh, so the Elementalist has the highest magic point multiplier, which means they can use the most abilities. Uh, but they have the smallest health pool, uh, which means they... They're very much a glass cannon. Um, yep. Ah, uh, the faithful. You, you already mentioned that the fourth one is is go that the fourth tree for them is going to be the more the more martial focused one as opposed to the yeah. the uh, the other three. Yeah. So the faithful has like at a glance you would maybe think that they they're the the cleric sort of class and the, they very much can be like the illumination tree and prayer trees are like light magic and healing and uh like buffs and debuffs mm-hmm. um but then they have the martyr tree which makes the faithful more powerful the less health that they've got so the more health they've got missing the stronger that they get and then, yeah, the Paragon Tree is like a mixture of martial skills and oaths that they can make that allow them to hit harder or uh, force a monster to only target them for a limited period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it makes them pretty much that frontline fighter and uh, the more traditional tanky type role in a party. I do appreciate that in the fluff for it, you have it that their loyalty is to a sun and, to a sun and moon god. Because yeah, it'd be it'd be very tempting to to ha- to have some sort of light theme when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to a divine ke- a, a divine archetype. Yeah, um, and so it very much is light themed, but like I think a lot of people kind of forget that the moon is that light and. Uh, Going a bit deeper into the fluff, um, the the moon has different sort of roles and aspects. So, like the light is all about um, warmth and healing and uh, life, while the moon is actually more about protection and guardianship. Mm-hmm. Like it is the the source of light and the darkness that kind of guides people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's why there's the duality there with the faithful. Like the the sun is what you traditionally associate with light magic, while the moon is more of that protective 
uh, guardian type role that the faithful can also take. Mm -hmm. Also, it was real. It was real cute of you to have the illumination skill tree have the appearance of an onk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the all the skill trees have big shapes that kind of represent uh, the 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 ability or or whatever it is. But like, yeah, because the, the illumination tree is about life and things like that. Uh, the ank uh, mm -hmm. seemed seemed an appropriate symbol. Yeah. And the the hexing the hexing would it be fair? I think from what I'm seeing, the hex the hexing focuses a whole lot on the so the softer magic as opposed to the elementalist harder magic. Yeah. Um, so again, the version that you've got there has the three trees, and there's the hexage tree, which has been given a new name to better fit the fact that it deals with fate and things like that a little bit more. Uh, and I've added in a proper hexus tree which has like almost like plague magic and uh, a lot of debuffs. Um, but yeah, the hexing is um, they can summon things very much like your traditional necromancer. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of throw extra bodies into the combat to kind of soak up hits and do damage. Uh, but yeah, their their magic's a lot more enhancing other things that they can do, or that their party members can do, mm -hmm. or manipulating the card deck. If you're using the what in that version of the document is is the hexes, uh, what in the final version of the game will be called the Moirai, which mm -hmm. is like the Greek name for like the fates. Um, but yeah, it allows them to kind of more subtly manipulate. Uh, the battlefield um, and combat in the game, or do things like talk to the dead and stuff like that to get clues or information about a, a given situation. Mm -hmm. And the stalker seem, from what I'm seeing, seems to be in the vein of um, your your rogues and more and your rangers. <clears throat> yeah, um, the stalker. Uh, as it is there is very much a range class. Um, I added the fourth tree, in, which is called Lycanthropy, mm -hmm. um, where it will allow the Stalker to take on a more melee role if they want, where they can sprout claws, they can regenerate their health, um, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, they, the idea is they're kind of mixed between ranger and rogue, so they dabble in shadow magic, they use range weaponry, but they also use traps, and with the lycanthropy tree they have that more animalistic, uh, cursed bestial side mm -hmm. um, to them. Yeah. Uh, that kind of put them more in tune with nature. Mm -hmm. Um. Is, this might be a bit of a deep cut, but I but I suppose in I suppose in some way I could link, I could I could bring some similarities between them and say the Kai Lords. Kai, uh, um, are you familiar at all with um, Lone Wolf? And uh, no. Yeah. Either th Lone Wolf started out as a, as a series of game books, and it's it got it's gotten to RPG adaptations. The first. Oh, wait, was, yeah. Is it Cub Cubicle Seven? They did the second one. They did the second one, which is between the two is actually the better one. The first was was called Lone Wolf Multiplayer Edition, um, which was done by Mongoose, but it was taking Lone Wolf and putting it into the D twenty system because, well, this was the early two thousands. Yeah, so everything had to be the D twenty system. <laughs> yeah. Every everything was trying to everything was trying to have a D twenty version, even if it made no bloody sense. Looking right at yep. you, fa um, fading suns and deadlands D twenty, which are in the category I'm, of we don't talk about that. I'm looking at Monty Coop, what of the darkness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that, I think that was I think that was still when Monty Cook had that had that ivory tower attitude that he had. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Which I do remember him getting yelled at for, for which is hilarious to me. But one thing that I do f find interesting with 
the way you have it set up is there's a kind of degree of success motif within within um not just the ski not just the skills but just in general where the the standard success is getting 13 yeah a but if you if you use if you have a face card or if you have the if you have your archetypes suit then you get a better degree of success yeah um, so the way the way that works is like say you have two ranks in one of your abilities and you want to use it some abilities in the game don't even require card rolls they just need the, ma the mana to spend mm -hmm. to do them but other ones usually attack abilities do yeah, so i've just drawn a card hand of cards here yeah with four cards because your default hand in abaddon is two mm -hmm. then you get bonus cards depending on your skill rank or your attributes at a certain point or whatever um now that also changes the target number as well uh so there's a variation there um and that was feedback after a few playtests but i've drawn four cards here and i have a, a two of hearts a king of spades a jack of diamonds and a five of clubs mm -hmm. so a king king is always going to be a 13 and if i was a hexing for example then the spades is there associated so um that would be a really good success um because it is both their suit and the face card yeah uh so it would either do a lot more damage or apply a bunch of additional effects or whatever um but i could also technically make a 13 with that jack and the two mm -hmm. the jack is an 11 um uh, and you could, with your hand of four cards, you could actually play both of those 13s. Mm. Uh, and you could combo. Yeah. Um, so you could either use the ability twice. Uh, if you were doing a regular attack, you could attack twice. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, one of the combo mechanics in Abaddon is uh, if you're using an ability uh, that requires you to play cards and You've got multiple thirteens or multiple successes because you might need less than the thirteen or uh, like the range phase. Um, you could play one to activate that ability, and then say you had an ability at a lower rank than the one you initially used. Mm -hmm. You could also use that second ability as well and combo them up. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of having like an action economy like in Fifth Edition or or Pathfinder, where you've got like three actions or set actions a turn abaddon by default you have one action on your turn but if you have the cards that you can play multiple that fit within your target range uh you can combo multiple actions into a single round of combat which is which is why i'm getting which is why i could see face cards being all being all the more vital because if you've got a king that that means you could you could potentially do multiple actions without having yeah. to um, use up that many cards. Yeah. I'm, now I'm get I'm guessing that the the hand that you end up generating when you're doing when you're doing an action is dependent on the attribute being used. Yeah. So um, the skills in the skill tree can uh, have a rank between one and five. Mm -hmm. Um. And for example, if you have a skill there that's rank two, you would draw two additional cards. Yeah. Uh, but it also adjusts the target number. So um, instead of being a 13, uh, you could actually play cards that are anywhere between an 11 and a 15. So Because the range is adjusted by the rank in your, uh, of your skill to widen it. Yeah, so... It is it a case where where the where the target number you're shooting for changes, or is it a case where it, where instead of a instead of a set target number, you have a bro, you have a broader high? Yeah, low. instead of a instead of a set target number, you have a broader higher low. Which so yeah, so if you you had one rank in something, then you could play cards that add up to twelve, thirteen, or fourteen. Would and that that, that expands? 
Yeah, that's that's an interesting approach. I think the only other game I can think of that's done that's done that kind of broad approach is that I've covered lately has been Zen Never Dies. But the but that's actually a smart move because in doing would it be fair of me to say that in doing that, um, players get somewhat of a buffer when it comes to pushing fate. Yep. Uh, it gives them it gives them a little bit more flexibility mm -hmm. um and the the push fate and pushing fate is the mechanic where they can choose the push fate um the gm of the game uh will draw a card and they can then try and match the cards that they've got to uh, create a success with whatever card that the gm has also drawn but if they can't if they still can't make a successful hand of cards with that then uh, something bad generally happens to them. Like either the monster that they're fighting will get a free attack off on them, or um, it might extend the duration if, like, they have the bleed effect on them. For example, it might extend the duration of that, or yeah, something bad will happen to them if they they can't uh, successfully make a hand of cards by pushing fate. Mm. The upside of that is if they can make a hand pushing fate. It always counts as if it was a handful of their soup, uh, which is the the upside of doing it. the The gamble that you're kind of taking by doing it is you're you're always going to end up with a decent success if you can make a hand by pushing for it. Mm -hmm. And because I I see pushing fate as the, as a high risk extra effort rule. Yeah. Because you can you, it's so it's a way to tr a way to try and get a way to try and force a force a success, but um you are but you are you are playing with fire if you do it. Yeah, it's it's got a cost if you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and I've seen it work out both ways to uh, during the play test to the player's advantage and disadvantage, um, which. You, it's interesting stories to tell around the table. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, have you have you considered down the road um, taking taking the skills and um, and making and putting them into the equivalent of say spell cards? Um. Yeah, I think that would be. I think it'd be useful to have around the table. Mm -hmm. Um. And I might do it, like I'm. I'm going to kickstart Abaddon. I might do a stretch goal or something like that, where I do a, a deck of uh, skill cards. Yeah, because um, I don't. I don't see all that many skills that would ha that would have lo that would have long amount that would have long amounts of text, like so like certain spells that we've seen in various games where it's almost a column long of how, of how the spell works. Yeah, no, there's not many, not many abilities in the game that have that. Um, I'm looking. No. Mm. Yeah, not really. You're talking. I usually have like a sentence worth of like flavor text. Then there's the 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 degrees of success. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like your mana cost, the the target and. I changed combat up since I initially drafted up the game. Uh, uh, where initially I designed Abaddon to be like a a grid based game, like you know D and D, where you're using like square grids and you're moving around. It's all tactical and stuff. And then I was play testing with a group of regular my regular players, and they were all like. You generally run theater of the mind. Why? Why did you pick? <laughs> tactical combat game to make uh, and I was like ah, that's a good point and it slows down combat a lot um, one of my favourite game systems is the One Ring mm -hmm. uh, which has a, a more abstract way of doing combat where you have different positions that the players choose in combat and they, they each have their ups and downs um and I decided to adapt a system more like that, where like there's an aggressive position, 
a reserve position which is a little bit more defensive or supportive and then there's the distant position which is for range combat mm -hmm. um and they all offer different benefits and drawbacks um and it just it simplifies combat it makes it flow a little bit quicker uh, and it, it still has the tactical elements because each position has different ups and downs and different skills can be used from different positions mm. um so yeah, you still have a tactical element there without people having to you know measure distances for spell effects and um calculate how many how far they can go in like a single turn or uh that that sort of stuff that can kind of slow down uh combat in other games yeah card based is card based designs and um and tactical grid combat they they in theory could mix but the way but the way to get there i'm not entirely sure i'm not entirely sure if it would be if it would be worth it i feel like it's it better it better suits theater of the mind yeah yeah so like when we are playing test playing we're generally doing it in foundry and i have like a simple grid set up that has three different combat positions in it that players can put their tokens into just so it's clearer to see which position everybody's in um, but that's the that's the only thing you're really in a tent, like worrying about. Um, uh, yeah, it's a it's a lot more free flowing, a lot more descriptive. Um, and yeah, it just kind of sp sped things up. Went from like the first few test plays of Abaddon, where combat with like a simple group of monsters would maybe take like. An hour or so, and it'd last six or seven turns to being um, about half that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Which, for co combat, is always the slowest thing in tabletop games, I feel. Um, and it's maybe one of my least favourite things in tabletop gaming is when combat take too long. Uh, but that might just be... Yeah, the ADHD. <laughs> uh, I've seen I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of people have have this approach of we need to we need to either either speed either speed up or get or get rid of or get rid of a lot of complex combat systems because there seems to be this almost fetishization of simplicity in some in some RPG circles. Um, I'm not a fan of throwing out the baby with the bathwater if you if you follow no. me. Yeah, there's a there's a line I think there of like you you still want combat to be engaging and tactical and stuff, but yeah, if it, if it draws out too long, then it becomes I'm a bit of a slog. I'm more I'm more in favor of giving of giving people a reason to use their kit. Yeah. Than than just th than just throwing the whole thing out and saying we're go we're going full theater of the mind because at that point you may as well just be playing Mother May I like why are you playing a you you forget that this is a role playing game, not yeah. If you want so just like, role yeah. playing, go 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 to go to the um go to, well here here in the states go to the SCA or something or something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, and I've seen that I've seen some takes on YouTube and things like that for like just just get rid of combat entirely from your role playing game. It's like. There's probably certain games where that's fine. I've played. I've definitely played World of Darkness games where we've had multiple sessions where combat doesn't happen. It's all social interaction, and politicking, and trying to screw everybody over. But like, yeah, World of Darkness is built around that. Um, but like, if you're playing a fantasy game and stuff like that, you kind of want to be in that sort of heroic position where, yeah, you're 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 fighting monsters or whatever. Um, I've always there's always a bit of there's always a bit of irony when people when people say that they want to put more role playing in 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 say a D, a D and D or a D and D like um approach because I'm thinking this is a game that was birthed from war gaming. What are you yeah. doing? If you if you want to if you want to if you want to have that heavy role play emphasis, why are you why are you playing this? 
Yeah, but I got that from you. Um, and yeah, like each group is different. Each group will put different emphasis on role playing. Um, Abaddon because of its inspirations. Like you're talking Diablo, which is you know has lore and has a plot and it's if you're into the game like i really love the diablo games i like the lore behind yeah. it but uh, most people don't play diablo games for the lore <laughs> no um, they play no they play it for, they play it for the loot even though there's there's, yeah, there's yeah. some inter- there are some very interesting el- some very interesting elements with diablo's setting because um blizzard ha- blizzard it well i was going to say there is but i should say were um good at good at establishing establishing worlds that people would want to um spend want to spend that amount of time in of course um, cur- obviously current day blizzard not with notwithstanding but i yeah. i had i had a copy of the sin war bo- book for diablo once upon a time so yeah the sin war trilogy is um really interesting in that oh. they are taking a lot of elements from that series of book for Diablo Four, but honestly, honestly, I have I have no desire to dive into Diablo Four because um, Blizzard has has burned me one to, one too many times. Oh yeah, yeah. I, and um... the the ARPG scene right now is what is one that is one where you can't say that Diablo is the is the big game in town. No. You're no, you're no. not exactly hurting for choice. I mean, we we've got Warhammer Chaos Bane, we've got Victor Vran, we've got the Van Helsing duology. There's um, Inquisitor Path Martyr. Of Exile. Yeah, Path, Inquisitor Path, Martyr. I'd say Path of Exile is the real big one, even if it can be a little unforgiving. Yep. Um, um, there, um, lost. There was Lost Ark, which released recently. I know some people don't like it, but I have to. Put, yeah. The point is, is that there's a lot yeah. out there. Yeah, you've and, got tons of choices, and um, a, uh, a lot out there at a at a very high quality. So you can't just rely on the name alone. Yeah, I, I like I I downloaded Diablo Four for the open beta, played it for about two or three hours, turned it off, and made a new character in Diablo Two. Uh. And even with Diablo 2, there's there's some ve- there's some very impressive mods about like say median yep. e- median XL, median XL or Project Diablo 2 makes so many quality of life improvements to the game. Or the one or that one madman who decided to say, "What if we did it, but Doom?" <laughs> the- uh, but yeah, they they can't really rely on the the franchise name anymore like Diablo 4 will probably do or probably sell lots um, of copies I'm not I'm not saying it's gonna I'm not saying it's gonna be a flop it's just it's just uh, the impact is going to be damaged because yeah, of all don't... the controversies that they've had over the last couple yeah. of years um there's there's too many things there with Blizzard um yeah it's just damaged that and well for for me at least I'm not I'm I I'm always gonna have what how they handled how they handled WoW in the back of my mind, especially the Shadowlands fiasco. Mm. You know, and take and taking a popular taking a popular character in WoW and going full Mary Sue with her. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. How how could I not how could I not bring up Sylvanas? <laughs> oh, the Banshee Queen ruined. Mm-hmm. The Banshee Queen, who who they who they decided to gimp everybody else to try and make her to try and make her look good, and then and then claim that she isn't a Mary Sue. It's like, don't piss on my head and tell me it's raining. Yeah, it's a shame because I like I liked Savannah, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, they 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 messed up. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> like between. Decisions with games and how the company sort of handles employees and stuff like that have just fallen quite quite away then. Yeah. Um. 
now one thing one thing i am one thing i am a bit cu i'm a bit curious about is when it comes to encounter design cuz obviously th there weren't any monsters in the document that you had sent me do you ha do you do you have plans on putting s not necessarily a challenge rating, but a kind of a broad difficulty appro approach? Um, so I don't plan on having a challenge rating sort of system for Abaddon. Um, within the descriptions of the individual monsters, and even just looking at the stat blocks of monsters, I'm trying to make it clear to the GM which monsters are maybe easier for beginning characters to face against versus uh, which kind of monsters will probably do a lot of damage mm -hmm. to um, to newbie characters. Um, there, there are mechanics in place for making monsters stronger. Um, like... Diablo has its like champion and unique monster type mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's mechanics there for turning a group of regular monsters into champions by adding some extra abilities onto them. Or turning one into a unique monster by adding even more special abilities to them. Um, there's mechanics as well for every time the player characters defeat one of the proper bosses like end of act bosses or or whatever um the the gm will take a, a a buff and apply it to every monster in the game going forth um so some of the monsters in the game should be able to keep continue continue being a threat to the players mm -hmm. um the more powerful the players get, then the more powerful everything else around about them is going to get. Um, and it's just to kind of keep the challenge consistent. Um, so you're never having monsters that the players really want massively outpower. Or like, like in, in D&D, &D, like where you'd maybe, after a certain point, there's no point of throwing goblins at players because they'll just blink and like, kill most of the, the goblins you've just thrown at them. Um, that's not something that I really want to happen with Abaddon, so like I want skeletons, some skeleton type monsters are one of the weaker monsters in the game. Uh, but I, I want to kind of keep them there as a re reoccurring monster type that can still pose a threat even as the players have already killed like two or three lords of hell. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's there's no challenge rating sort of thing, but there are mechanics there and things there that should indicate to the, the GM what's a suitable threat, what isn't, how to make threats a little bit more threatening if they're feeling that the players are, are out performing things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but still kind of keeping keeping everything fairly straightforward. Like the GM's role in Abaddon is kinda passive. It's like a an a powered by the apocalypse type game where the, the GM has actions and things like that that they can take for a, a felon or a monster that the, the players then react to. Um so like the GM is never really drawing cards. The players are the ones that are only really drawing cards in the game. Mm -hmm. um, so if a monster attacks a player it's the player who draws a hand of cards to dodge instead of the GM drawing a load of cards to actually land the hit mm -hmm. and to that to that end I'm get I'm guessing that there that you do have some you do have some ideas in mind for special equipment yep um so I have a list of like, weapons and armor and all that sort of stuff um, already kind of typed out. Um, so equipment, or like particular weapons and armor and stuff, uh, has a 
appear right into it. Um, so, like, characters at the start will only do they ever find or have access to, like, tier 1 weapons and armor, which tend to have lower damage ranges and uh, a lower amount of, like, damage reduction and things like that. But, like, again, it's where killing bosses in the game has the advantage. Uh, when you kill a boss or two, depending on how long you want the campaign to play out, mm-hmm. uh, it will unlock higher tiers of equipment for the the players to get access to. Yeah. Um, where, yeah, uh, if they kill a boss or two, then suddenly they can get access to weapons that do more damage, or armor that soaks more damage, or uh, there's I have tables, random tables for making magic items and things like that. Mm-hmm. All kind of work that um, where you're drawing cards and you're determining like the type of item that you might be getting and the, the affixes that are getting attached to that item that give it special abilities. Um, and then all the actual the the Lords of Hell, like the main bosses in the game, all have unique artifacts that players can potentially get after defeating them. Uh, that are a little bit more powerful than what they might randomly generate from uh, beating monsters or finding chests or whatever. Mm -hmm. And with now with that in with that in mind, um, do you have a date in mind as far as when you plan on launching the Kickstarter? Uh, The Kickstarter is going to launch on the first of September. And I and uh, I'm guess I'm guessing that you plan on running that one for thirty days. Yeah, it's going to be a fairy day Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Um, um, what do you see the? I'm guessing you don't see the full book going mo- going more than a hundred pages. Um, it it m- might go more than maybe. Think two hundred. Um. So I'm looking at the so I have a working document mm-hmm. where like uh, a friend of mine uh, is editing Abaddon for me. Uh, so we have a working document that we both go between where I add stuff to it and he'll edit it, um, or I'll highlight things that have maybe changed so he can go back and like double check. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it doesn't have any artwork or it's not in the the PDF layout, which was just to give me an idea of how I'd like to eventually lay the book out. Um, it's sitting at sixty three pages, uh, and it doesn't have the section on monsters or anything like that in it yet. So um, yeah, once there's artwork and stuff put in and it's been laid out, yeah. It'll probably be about 200 pages. Mm-hmm. And I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular madness that happens around here. Yeah, no worries. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll have a drink after I get off the the fun chat, and because um, it's yeah, it's almost eight eight p.m. here, so mm-hmm. it's it's a suitable time to to unwind. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I know that card based games aren't everybody's cup of tea, so it was it was really cool that you wanted to hear. A bit more about it. Well, I've I've made it I've made it clear that I'm not that I'm not out to to fu- to um pr- to preach the right way on how, on how these things should be done. I don't I don't care I don't care for design by gospel. Uh and every, everybody ha- everybody has a deck of cards somewhere, so we may as well use them. Yeah, we may as well get use out of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but and yeah, what else no, are you going to use them for? Poker. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's true. Like, I, I think I, I think it's nice to try something a little bit different every now and again. Um, yeah, and 
the and with the current climate, I think people are going to more and more want something different. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's that's something I've noticed in the twenty plus years of playing tabletop games is um the hobby's grown, definitely grown. Uh, but that just means there's more people out there that want to try mm-hmm. different things. Yeah. And and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>